yeah, that's it wasn't right. meant for you, yeah, so, right. <laughs> you know, right. and, um, and I think that, I mean, THQ, a company we work with a lot, they do not send out review copies because yeah. they're just, it's just, it's just mm. it's, I mean, they spend all their money on the license and that's their marketing mm. of it. Unless it's an original game, you'll see difference if it's an original game like Destroy All Humans, mm. then they'll play, they'll play the um, reviewer thing, but especially if it's a game for 25 year olds I mean yeah, that's the thing if you if you if you if you're doing a game that's a 25 year old demographic then yeah put it out for review right. but if you're doing a child's game or you know girls game right. or something um, there's no one to review it. yeah there's no one to review it and you know you know you you can see a re review you can even get stupid cases on things where yeah the reviewer slammed it and then like most online reviews have the, like the forum bit underneath and the forum mm. people love it yeah, you know, right. the reader votes always is higher than the reviewers yeah. thing, yeah. which is just. Um, but there's this kind of new kind of review. I noticed that the Age on a Friday, I think they have the kids game mm. review in that. Mm. There's a few kind of mm. other mm. niche areas. In some ways, it's so paper the, the reviewers that aren't game geeks are probably sometimes the better reviewers because they're sort of looking at a little bit. They're broader cultural. Broader yeah. cultural. Yeah, yeah. Look more professional. Yeah, what their kids yeah. like to play or whatever. You yeah. Know. yeah, and also does yeah. it work, which is, mm. you know, for me, mm. which is really nice about it. Yeah. We should be talking about Beam, I suppose. <laughs> we digress. Sorry, that was interesting. <laughs> 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 so I suppose, um, going back to Beam, um, talking about, can we ask you about Aussie Games? Uh, yes, a slight twitch. <laughs> <laughs> Aussie Games, what would you like to know? What was it? Why was it done? What happened to it? I don't remember. <laughs> it was all done on a whiteboard. <laughs> um, it was done for Mindscape, if memory mm. serves me correctly. And um, look, I, I don't know if it was Greg Barnett's idea or his idea and Fred Milgram's or you know, how it came about, but there was this feeling that Aussies at that time was sort of flavour of the month uh, abroad in the US, whatever. And um, we felt that there was this sort of, and there were a few games coming out, Olympic game type of games, and games. And we, and we triathlon, you know, decathlon, that sort of stuff. And we thought, well, maybe we can just sort of make a quick, you know, killing doing a bit of an Aussie game so they get that Aussie flavour in there. And we had just had stupid games in there. It was, the idea was that we have like, it wasn't meant to be one broad game. It was meant to be six or seven or eight little games all put together. We just do little activities, much like decathlon games are and triathlon games are. So. I don't recall all the, what we call mini games, uh, I don't recall what they were all there, I only recall my two that I made. And I, none of us really wanted to work on this project, I didn't want to work on the project, I was only ever supposed to do one of the sections, I ended up doing two because someone else refused utterly and flatly and almost wanted to leave the company or whatever. So I ended up, or, or maybe even worse, maybe someone started one of the other projects and didn't get it done. I think that's how I got one of these mini games to do. But I did um, a belly flop game, the idea being that I had this diver on the platform and <laughs> it's just ridiculous. All he had to do was jump off the platform and try and do a belly whacker onto the water and that was it. And the skill was just trying to make sure that your guy was perfectly flat when he hit the water as possible and how big of a splash that you made. That was one of the games. Excellent. Um, We've got pictures of that one. I think. <laughs> the other one was probably more, more interesting, I thought. Well, we ha I'd actually created, uh, I did a um, pit stop two for Commodore 64. So I'd, I actually had some um, technology or some code already written that would actually make a road technology, a bending road, curving road, a road that would sort of make it look like it was moving towards you. So we took that chunk of code and we put a, a little Jeep on there, a spotlighting Jeep. And we had a driver in the Jeep driving the Jeep. We had a dog next to him, a little uh, border collie. And we had two guys in the back with shotguns. And the guy driving the Jeep was drinking beer and throwing the beer bottles out of the Jeep. And the two guys in the back had to try and shoot the beer bottles. <laughs> was a culture. A good Aussie, a good Aussie <laughs> pastime. <laughs> I'm surprised that was allowed. Well, it wasn't in the end. I <laughs> said, oh, so this, is, this is that at that transition period, you know, you were, you know, you would have on a Commodore 64 or something, but yeah, there's no way you would have had an NES version. And, uh, <laughs> and to give you an idea about a lack of design and how we just sort of made do, is we just said, oh, well, it's not beer, it's soda pop. That's so, for the American market, we called it soda pop, even though we all knew that it was beer. <laughs> and so, but there was still this strange concept of people throwing soda bottles out of the car and shooting them and having glass go everywhere. 
the other idea that we came up with, I can't remember if it was Greg's idea or mine or whether we were just sort of, you know, chewing the fat one day and had a laugh and decided to put it in. But we thought, wouldn't it be fun while the driver's drinking that he'd occasionally have occasional chuck? And so we had this driver going along drinking beer and then puking. <laughs> and that's just how all things were done. <laughs> I forget what the dog did. I think the dog just sort of did the occasional backflip in the front just to do something and occasionally lick the driver's face or something. But it was just a strange... What a ridiculous game. But it, when you look back at it, it's probably one of the more interesting games of Aussie games. <laughs> I, <can't... laughs> I think there was a bass fishing type of one in there. Um, I think there was, yes, there was a fishing game where you'd sort of cast a line into the water and... How many games in total? Like, how many mini games in total? Because I, I think there was supposed to be like um, <coughs> eight, but I think it ended up being seven. I think. Yeah. yeah. And I think Bruce Bailey, uh, not, no, no relation to Andrew, but a guy called Bruce Bailey was a guy that did the fishing game. I think. Yeah. I, I remember Greg getting a bit frustrated because Bruce was taking a long time just to do fishing. You know. Well, that's what fishing is. It takes a long time. <laughs> it takes a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you did bedlam. You were talking about that as well. Wasn't yeah, that was. Yeah, that was a fun memory of mine just because it was my first project and I was working with, uh, like I said before, with Nigel Spencer. And it was also, we, back, we had little game, you know, teams of two and the, another team of two was Andrew Davey and David Pentecost. And uh, these two guys are both Tasmanian. So there's a Tassie joke coming up here, but uh, one morning, uh, I think it was Andrew Davey coming really excitedly into work and said, Dave, Dave, I've looked into our family tree and you and I are related. You know, they've got the same great, great, great grandfather. Nigel just nonchalantly turns around the corner and looks at them and says, all Tasmanians are related. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just one of those uh, moments in Beam history where the entire company just erupted and cracked up laughing. <laughs> When you look at it back now, there's not much of a joke there, but it was funny at the time. <laughs> it's, are you guys all keep in con do you keep in contact with a lot of band people? It's sort of like occasional contact. Like you, you, well, you obviously see Bill, you guys know. We, we, yeah, we know Bill fairly well because um, Bill and I, we used to argue about the most ridiculous things. when, like We would co both come in early. Uh, I would come in early because I had a regular train to catch. I was you know, training my train at that time, so I always got in a certain time. First half hour of every morning, Bill and I would just argue about ridiculous things, um, or very geeky things. Um, he was working on the Sinclair Spectrum, which had a Z80 processor in it. I was working on the Commodore 64, that had a 6510 or whatever it was. And we would argue about which processor was the best and why. You know, oh, this, that's rubbish in structure, this one's better. Or the other favourite argument amongst all the programmers at the time was which editor did you use? All the editor oh, did was yes. something that you typed in the code into. And we would argue about... Yeah, you know, Bill would use one thing and I'd be using another one and say, oh, that's rubbish, you need to be using this. And we would argue, spend half a day arguing, or half an hour arguing every day. And this is back to the this lack yeah. of professionalism that the company had at the time. And it's only when everyone started flooding into the company that was sort of, oh, yeah, we better get back to work. So, um... But yeah. obviously it was, a, I mean, it's still quite a large camaraderie and the whole... Yeah, so it was always... Yeah. Yeah. Because everyone talks so fondly and remembers things so fondly about that time. Even even the semi-bad things are still funny to talk about. <laughs> 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 I remember Rod Richards uh, busting a watermelon open on one of um, our producer's keyboards and leaving all this watermelon sitting in the keyboard for a whole weekend. <laughs> Brewing away, disgusting it was. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't know why he did it, but we were just throwing watermelons around the place, you know. <laughs> just the things that you do when you're at work, yeah. <laughs> and um, people like Adam Lansman, was, were, was, he was obviously so, I suppose, outspoken about Australian video game profiling and all that sort of stuff when he was, when he was in his time. Is that, does Australia still have a similar sort of profile? Has anyone taken up that gauntlet and take the same sort of profile? Not since Adam's death, yeah. not really. No, I wouldn't say no. so at this point. Yeah. Um, no, I'd, no. Yeah, I'd say far there's been no one that sort of really stepped up. And, so has that sort of, sort of fire sort of dissipated a bit? Not really. I don't, I don't know why. Maybe it's just because of the way the games industry was born in Australia that, you know, Fred and Adam were the elders, mm. you know, so to speak. And so everyone sort of looked up to them and knew that these guys had sort of helped form mm. the whole gaming culture here in Australia. Well, I think the thing is we, we do, we have a industry body now and I think that's it. I mean, Adam's 
formed that and left that as his legacy almost. Mm. And um, yeah, so I don't think there needs so much the individual now. There is mm. an actual proper professional industry body to do mm. it. And I know we're actively involved in that um, as, a, as a company. And um, and I think, yeah, we all speak through that now, you know, in terms of uh, as a local industry. So that's not just one individual like it was before. It's yeah. So it's, doesn't, it's not, you know, it's not requiring one person to champion <coughs> industry. So um, Adam was successful, basically, in his, his legacy there. And the, the just one little memory too. I was describing before you that big guy that used to take all the biscuits. Mm -hmm. uh, to give you an idea about the sort of strange people we used to employ back then, he his claim to fame was that he was only the one of two people in the entire world that was an expert on Martian climatology. So he knew all there was to know about the weather on Mars. He had a thesis in it, a PhD in it, and there was only one other guy at that time in history that was capable of marking his thesis, some guy in NASA. So he was this guy making video games The Hobbit and knew all there was to know about weather on Mars. That's incredible. At that point in time. <laughs> Obviously I know a lot more now. But you know. <laughs> so what I'm trying to stress is that we had a whole collection of people that had these funny little weird mm. niche interests. Um, Which is really quite different to an hour, isn't it? Because as people can now train in yeah. designing mm. video games. And I mean, that's the other side of it. As well as you know, the industry body, there's now uh, academic, a number of academic bodies for, for video games mm. in Australia. And um, yeah, people, if they want, you know, if they're 14 and want to get into the industry now, can actually have something to aim for. Um, a course. I don't think many of them are full. I think most of them are like second courses, aren't I think? You can yeah. do a degree and then. That's right, you have to do a degree do, and then get in. Yeah, and then do it, do it as almost finishing school. And, um, but anyway, yeah, there's actually some sort of qualifications mm. you can do. And um, also, just obviously, the whole, the whole concept of the industry is more well known now. Um, people know there is an Australian. Industry, so they'll go looking for companies. Like I said, in Melbourne House days, nobody really knew there was an industry, and people just found it by accident. I think now people can go forward and yeah, get a good basis it. for it now yeah. in in, ed, in formal yeah. education. Whereas before there was no formal education, so you had no basis. Mm -hmm. And we we're talking before about yeah, who trains the trainers, which is a constant problem. But that's any industry is sort of like that. And traditionally, you know, my lecturers that I had at university were ex-industry guys. Mm. I don't know of any ex-industry game guys that are now lecturing in game mm. uh, education. Mm. And it's just something that, I don't know why, but none of us are interested in the education well, side of things. Some, and some us the doing it personally. Probably, you know, we're probably only just getting back to the age where that, I mean, that's what the sort of becomes a career option. Have <laughs> you, you know, become sort of <laughs> professor yeah, yes. of gaming, professor <laughs> of gaming or something? But yeah, I mean, it's still there isn't actually. Yeah, who would you, who would take? You know, like I said there's industry, you know, industry based lecturers. You know, um, we do know one guy, Christian, I think, who does some done a little bit of um, lecturing, mm. but um, mainly, yeah. Um, the, you know, the courses do ask from time to time, you know, for um, to come to first to come and yeah, <laughs> first to come and pay a visit, and you know, to put a little bit more, you know, industry founding into the whole course and stuff. But um, at the moment, because the courses are quite small, so really, a course is either if you're on artist side, it's just a three D package type mm. thing, and from programming view, it's probably just almost only one cycle of a using a game engine or something. Um, I think if you start seeing full four-year um, courses in um, game design, about game programming, then you probably will need that same sort of thing that you know other degree courses have where you actually have representatives of the industry mm. actually part-time mm. lecturing. The people who are actually doing it for real at the same mm. time as lecturing. Um, we don't quite have that yet, but it's, it's only it's only early days. It's only been a few years. That's mm. right. And as you course say, is going. you know, as you know, as your businesses move through and as you're moving through yeah. with other people in there, it will become an, an option. You know, mm. for this generation of game designers to be out there lecturing. Yeah. But do you see? I suppose you're, you're, it's quite positive to have obviously to have coursework that is specifically for game design, but it does 
change, I suppose, how eclectic what you were talking about in terms of the people who were involved in it. A different uh, yeah, yeah. type of person coming through. Yeah. Yes, it yeah. definitely is. Like um, the guys that we employ at Tanklers are. Uh, um, they're all game. Free. They're all game people. You know. That's yeah, but what they, they don't. They don't about. tend to have that strange quirks that we used to have. Mm. Yeah, they wouldn't be a guy who's got an expert. You know, Martian climatology. They're more normal people. Mm. Whereas generally back in the you know the eighties, well, uh, the guys that were capable of programming games were also fairly eccentric people, mm. on the whole. Mm. Whereas just less eccentric now. And uh, well, I suppose you can see it as a business now. You can that's see right. Career options. Yeah, that's right. Yes, all the, of you were saying definitely it's people coming. Like none of, none I mean, of we're us getting, you know, you get you, you get a lot of graduates, you know, special mm -hmm. applications, you know, so. You no, no. Although, you know, when you think back, none of us had any doubt that we were in a, an industry that was going to explode, even though, even though, we, if you didn't want to mm -hmm. stay in the industry, as soon as you were at Melbourne House, we all knew that one day this was, yeah. going to be huge, like it is now, um, but it's just a matter of when, you know, and how it was going to happen, and how it took how it took shape. So that was one of the questions you, you had on that list, yeah. But, um, we, were there, we had no doubt that it was going to be huge. I don't think anyone said, oh, this was going to be a flash in the pan. We all knew it was going to be massive. That's amazing. It must have been quite exciting to see that. Yeah, we were, we were sort of too much, you know, heads down, tails up and doing the actual work to sort of think too much about where it was heading. Yeah, that was time. not yeah. our... We were sort of still more interested in just the technical aspects of what we were doing. We measured our lives not in years. We measured our lives in projects, mm. and you became so absorbed by a project that, and so stressed by a project in the latter term, in the in the, in the latter part of it, that as you finished a project, it felt like a great release, and all of a sudden the world was real, and you'd wake up in the morning and hear birds tweeting, and mm. I, it sounds like strange, but I think without. Any exception, all programmers will describe their life like that. The end of a project, when it was all said and done and published and on the shelf, you could finally relax and take some time off and take it easy and, you know, appreciate things that were happening. You know, like birds twittering in the morning. <laughs> was it ever about personal kudos for you guys or was it just the love of...? Both, you know, yeah. generally. There were people who were into the kudos more than other people, but, I mean, one of the reasons why I liked you know, working in games was not the kudos but I liked the fact that you could create something that you had a major influence over and you saw people appreciate and like and play and use whereas my ba background being engineering I had a lot of friends at the time that were doing very strange or mundane tasks in engineering like one guy was counting how many screws that were in a headlight on a car he worked for Ford or Holden or whatever and that's what his job was and making sure those screws were okay and to me it was it didn't feel like a direct contact with a final user of the of the thing. Something not as romantic. So, you know, but all my, all all of my engineering peers are always you know paid a lot more than what I was. But you know, at the same time, they had to experience a more boring mm. type of environment. Mm. Ours was certainly an interesting environment. Just. Um, but it had its, it was very much, you know, at massive stress times and also massive times when you just wasted a lot of time and achieved very little and had a great time. <laughs> and, and during those all night benders that we used to do, you know, that was towards the end of the project where you'd have to sort of, you know, maybe work 48 hours, sometimes even as long as 72 hours non stop. You might only have an hour's sleep in the middle of it. And I remember the, uh, around the corner when we were in Tope Street, around the corner there was the Silver Top Taxi Cafe. And that was the place where we all went to have these Breakfast. incredibly <laughs> greasy, horrible chips at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock at night. You'd be there eating chips and whatever with all these taxi drivers in like 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and that was a fond memory. I mean, there's apartments built there now, but this little silver top taxi the cafe was taxi. one of our favourite haunts. Yeah. Mm. Uh, heart attack material. We've covered so yeah. much stuff. Thank you so much. <laughs> that was fantastic. Yeah. Probably remember things afterwards as well. Feel free to email them, of course. Yeah. Yeah, no, really. I put together a little furtive book on you and Andy Davies, crazy emails. And, <laughs> 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 and then we'll get everyone sued. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Find out what really happened. Oh, that's right. 
No, I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> then that every drug can party. And every minor someone fell over two pissed and... Actually, he was so pretty That was always way. Andrew. Andrew was always... I had oh. a feeling it must be. No, I actually um, did, I think, save Adam's life at one Christmas party. <laughs> he was so drunk that he was he just crawled into in, uh, to the toilet and if I wasn't there holding his head oh, above the basin, he would have just drowned... <laughs> In the thing, actually, it's just a hot wally. I just like, hold his head there while he threw up. Otherwise, he would have just drowned in it. I remember his, his that wife was and his kids rocked up to pick uh, up from the party. And took, took, yeah, took, me took, little, took me a little. Took me a little. Yes, we're carrying out Adam, and we're, we didn't actually recognise his wife straight away. So we said, "Get out of the way." <laughs> 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 and there's two kids in the car going, oh, "Hello, my daddy. Look at his daddy." Oh, <laughs> that happened quite a lot. <laughs> I was like, oh dear. So, but Andrew, uh, Andrew, back in those days, he also used to hit the. Uh, the bourbon and the scotch quite a lot as oh, well God, and yeah. be known to <laughs> end up in a yes. gutter. Oh there was a follow up when I was, did pretty bad. Oh no, there was a bad one then. The following Christmas party, Adam started handing out the green stuff. You know, the... Ah, uh, yes, yes, yes. yes. 